Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Champion Forest. Each Sunday, we are thrilled to gather with you in the house of the Lord, and we cannot wait to worship with you this morning. Before we get started, we have a quick announcement for all the students and parents of students in the room. Are you prepared for the best weekend of the year? Middle and high schoolers, get ready because Freedom Weekend is coming up fast. Join us as we experience a life-changing weekend that you will not forget. The fellowship will be inevitable, the activities will be exciting, the worship will be epic, and the name of Jesus will be praised. You do not want to miss it, so students, get signed up today. Invite a friend and be ready. And to all of our members, we need ambitious volunteers to come alongside our young people and serve at Freedom Weekend. Events like these will not be possible without you. To get registered to attend or to serve, text FREEDOM to 77069. We cannot wait to witness the move of God with you at Freedom Weekend 2024. And church family, we encourage you to join us in prayer for our students as they prepare for an encounter with Jesus. We always have something exciting going on around the church for all ages. For more information on our news and events, text weekly to 77069. To all of our first time guests out there, we'd love to get to know you. Whether you're joining us at one of our three campuses or watching online, just text guests to 77069. This helps us connect with you and allows us to answer any of your questions. Once again, welcome to Champion Forest. Let's open up our hearts as we begin to worship the Lord together. Good morning, church. Would you stand to your feet with us? We're so thankful to be in the house of the Lord. Would you join with us and declare the word of the Lord that says, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Shout it out with me. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Come on, a little louder. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley and praise on the mountain. Oh yeah, I praise when I'm short. I praise when I'm down. I praise when I'm down and praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the
Amen. Amen. Well, welcome to Champion Forest Baptist Church. We are glad you are here this morning. If you're a guest, I hope you'll take just a second and text the word guest to 77069. We'd love to know you're here. We'd love to tell you a little bit about Champion Forest. It's a great day to be in the house of the Lord. Would you take just a second, turn to somebody next to you, tell them good morning, maybe shake somebody's hand. All right, all right. Well, would you please be seated for just a second? We're excited this morning to get to celebrate with some people in life change as we're going to celebrate the, the gift of baptism. Would you point your attention to the screens and let's watch as, as we observe baptism this morning? Yes, thank you, Brent. Good morning, Champion Forest. We have two that's getting baptized today. First, we have Audrey Noss. Audrey, are you following Jesus in baptism because you have made him Lord and Savior of your life? All right, upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you as my sister in Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And next we have Crystal Barraza making her way in. All right, Crystal, are you following Jesus in baptism? Because you made him Lord and Savior of your life. Yes, sir. Based upon that profession of faith, I now baptize you as my sister in Christ, in the name of, and I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. What a Savior, what a God. Would you please stand with us in worship? We thank you, Jesus. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light. Till from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From a throne of endless glory, to a cradle in the dirt. Sing this with us.
nobody like Jesus, amen? Jesus, our King, can you think about that? Imagine, we know kings of this earth, they would not give up their throne for their servants. But our God sent his son in the form of a man, his only son, Jesus, to die for us, to pay a debt that we could never cover. And I don't know about you, but I'm thankful. I'm grateful that I don't have to give any, there's nothing that I could give that could cover the imperfection, the unrighteousness that exists within myself. And in response to that, I just simply sing to the Lord and I sing, Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. And sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. If you believe that, sing a little louder. Jesus paid it all to him I owe. All my sin had left a crimson stain. He it was Watch and pray, find in me, find all in all. For Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. And sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow.
more time, let's sing this chorus today. Jesus paid it all off to him. Sin and death, sin, he washed it white as Sing, he washed. The message of that song is the message that our church heralds. If you're here today and maybe you're not a follower of Jesus, you're a guest trying out the church thing for the first time and you're saying, what is all this carrying on about? Uh, well, it's about that song. The Bible teaches uh, from the very beginning that because of sin, which separates us from God, God demanded a blood sacrifice. And through the years in the Old Testament, people would bring their sacrificial lambs to be slaughtered and that blood would according to the scripture appease the wrath of God but the blood of lambs and bulls and goats found their fulfillment in Jesus Christ when John the Baptist saw Jesus he said that is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and so when Jesus went to that cross and died on a cross and shed his blood for us that's why we sing all to him I owe. Because there's nothing that could forgive our sin, no good deeds, no amount of church attendance. Uh, there's nothing that, that we could do for our sins to be forgiven, nothing that we could do to restore us to a right relationship with God. And that's why Jesus came, came on a rescue mission to save us from our sins. And when we ask Jesus to be the Lord of our life, he cleanses us. And the scripture says, just what we just lifted up, he makes us white as snow. That's why we worship, that's why we sing, that's why we praise, because only Jesus, only Jesus and his blood shed for us could make us as white as snow. And we rejoice in that truth this morning and uh, it's a powerful message. If you never received Jesus into your life, you're gonna have an opportunity to do so before you leave today. I wanna encourage you to go ahead and be seated. And as you're taking a seat, uh, I want our ushers to come to receive the morning offering. You know, we uh, worship in numerous ways around here. We worship through singing and praising. We worship through praying to the Lord. We worship through the teaching and preaching of God's word. And we worship through our giving. Uh, we know uh, that God has blessed us so that we can bless others. And so when you give, you're giving to the Lord through his church. And we always like to share with you uh, just some of what your giving goes towards. And with today being Sanctity of Life Sunday, we always set apart the third uh, Saturday tip, uh, Sunday typically in January for Sanctity of Life and really just serves as a reminder uh, to us as a church uh, that uh, the Lord is the author and creator and sustainer of life. According to Psalm chapter 139, he knits us together in our mother's womb. And so we believe that every life has value. We are pro-life as a church from the womb to the tomb. And uh, we are all in on doing everything that we can uh, to fight for life. And there's a number of ways that we do this as a church. Uh, last, uh, in 2022, when Roe v. Wade was overturned, we wanted to make a positive uh, difference and uh, we created what we know as Life 624, and that's a ministry in our church that comes alongside uh, families who are wanting to get into the foster care and adoption game. And so if you're here today and uh, you're interested in that ministry, just text LIFE to 77069, and we would love to tell you more about Life 624. Uh, we come around families who are adopting and helping foster uh, care, opening up their homes for foster care, and we help you from a resources standpoint. We help you from a networking standpoint. We want to come alongside you in that way. Also, we have with us two ministries today. When you uh, leave, I want to make sure that you go down our great hallway because we've got a couple of ministries there, including Life 624. Also, CareNet Pregnancy Center. Many of you serve with CareNet. It's a pregnancy center right here in our backyard, and uh, we support this through our mission 
Foundation dollars. In fact, we just helped them launch a new pregnancy center over in the Humble area. And so uh, we are on the move and locking hand in hand uh, with CareNet Pregnancy Centers who comes alongside uh, those who are in unplanned pregnancies and uh, not only gives them care, shows them the sonogram, their baby that is there, talks to them about life, shares with them the gospel, and we see babies saved physically and people saved spiritually at CareNet Pregnancy Center all of the time. We're grateful for this ministry as well. And then one other ministry we want you to be aware of on the life front is called H3 Helpline Ministries. And this is a ministry that is uh, right out of this church, members of this church uh, who help lead in this. And this is a toll-free hotline number uh, because we know uh, that um, uh, when we talk about saving babies, it involves more than just uh, the mother, it involves the father as well. And so this is a helpline. If you have maybe experienced abortion in the past and you carry with you guilt and shame and you just can't shake it, you know, we just believe as Christians, the truth of Romans chapter eight, verse one, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is freedom found in Christ. And the people that serve in this ministry have experienced abortions. And you can call them 24 hours a day. They have a booth right here on Main Street, that are the, right down our great hallway there. If you wanna go down and uh, just seek uh, them out, uh, we stand ready to help in any way that we can because we want to offer hope and healing that is ultimately found in the person of Jesus Christ. And so these are three great ministries. And uh, again, it's just a way to highlight uh, life today on this Sanctity of Life Sunday and a way to highlight that when you give to the work of Champion Forest, your giving is going to help ministries just like these. And one more thing on the life front. Uh, I have uh, with me today sitting on this front row, Mr. Mark Taylor. Mark, would you just stand up right here and just wave your hand? Mark is the founder of a ministry called Changing Destinies. And when we talk about life, he is on the front lines in India, in the slums of India. And he is helping save little girls from sex, sex trafficking. And he saves them and he puts them in a boarding school. This ministry has only been going for five years. And are you ready for this? They have saved 150 young ladies uh, right there in India. And Mark, we honor you today and your ministry. That's changing destinies. And uh, again, uh, we want to be pro-life because we know uh, that uh, Jesus, as he said in the scripture, is the author and perfecter of our life. And so I want us to pray and uh, thank you for giving and uh, blessing uh, our ministry and work in this way. Lord Jesus, thank you uh, for your goodness to us, your grace to us, uh, just as the song we just lifted up, Lord, all to you we owe. And uh, Lord, we know we could never repay you for your goodness and your grace and your forgiveness. Uh, but Lord, we do wanna honor you by bringing uh, our tithes and our offerings to you because you're worthy. And we know that you don't need our money, uh, but Lord, when we give it, it doesn't, um, it doesn't stay attached to us. It doesn't keep our heart back, it shows that Lord, we trust you by giving to others. And I just pray that you'd bless those that give today and these ministries that are standing for life and hope and healing. Uh, Lord, what a blessing they are. And I pray that they would know, uh, Lord, of the great work that they do today. We love you, Jesus. We honor you. And it's in the name of Christ we pray, amen. Dominions, all powers 
and positions your name stands above them all and the angels cry holy oh creation cries holy you are lifted high holy holy forever if you've been forgiven if you've been redeemed sing the song forever come on sing it out church Forever and amen, and the angels cry. say that you are holy and that your name is the name above all other names that at that name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are the king of kings and the lord of lords you will always be holy forever god we love you it's through the blood of jesus we pray amen amen would you please be seated
you have your Bibles, I wanna invite you to grab them and turn to John chapter three. I am so excited about this new series we're beginning today. In fact, I hadn't been this excited about a series since the last one we preached, okay? And uh, I introduced this whole concept of the Kingdom Project to our staff earlier this week. We have twice a year, once in the fall, once in the spring, uh, we set aside a day to intentionally pray and typically we'll worship together and uh, really just get on the same page as it relates to mission and vision, making sure that we're all going in the same direction so that we can lead you as a church in the same direction. And uh, that's what we did this week. And if you've been here for any amount of time, when we get together and talk about mission and vision, we introduced a statement to you. You saw it in the video, what we call a focus statement. I'll put it on the screen for you. And essentially what we say is champion for us advances the kingdom by making disciples. And this statement is meant to be a filter through which we prioritize our ministries and even our funding. Are we doing this? Champion Force advances the kingdom by making disciples. That's focus priority number one. Loving our community. That's a focus priority number two. And strengthening the church. Focus priority number three. This series that we're going to be in for the next seven weeks is all about highlighting the first part of that statement, that champion force advances the kingdom. What do we mean when we use this word kingdom? It's not the kingdom of champion force. This world doesn't revolve around us, and our calling as a church is not simply to expand our influence. Now, we know to whom much is given, much is required, and God has blessed us as a church. And so we, of course, want to use our resources, both from a people standpoint and a money standpoint, to bless others and to serve others. We want to leverage everything in us. We know eternity is at stake in people's life. And so we want to leverage everything that we are so that we can, as a church, influence and expand and grow. That's part of the strengthening the church, that third focus priority. But ultimately, it's not about us. It's not about growing our little kingdom here in Northwest Houston. It's about the kingdom of God. And that's what the title of the message is today. If you're taking notes, as I always encourage you to, it is the kingdom of God. Now, I first had the idea to preach a message series like this way back in 2013. If you don't believe me, I brought a picture of my journal to show it to you. From 2013, you can't read my writing up there, but it says 6, 17, 13. And I have circled there and highlight the Kingdom Project. I was in Romania. I was actually flying into Romania, and as I was looking out the window of the airplane, I saw homes spread across the landscape as far as the eye could see. And as we were going there on mission, uh, I just began to be burdened about how the gospel of Jesus Christ, this good news that Jesus died for our sins and was raised on the third day, how are all these homes spread across this landscape, how are they going to hear this good news? Now, I knew we had TV and radio and internet and a lot of people putting uh, you know, their messages out there and there's access to the gospel. I also know that there are missionaries and there are pastors and there are church planners. But even then, even then, uh, with all of these good resources and all of these people and all of these churches, even then, uh, there were just too many people to reach. And so how could we ensure that they all heard the message of Christ? How could we all ensure that they could hear this news that God created them and has a purpose for them? And it was in that moment that uh, the Lord just began speaking to my heart and impressed upon my heart that the solution to getting the message of Christ, not just to every single person in Romania, but every single person in Houston, Texas, every single person in your neighborhood, at the school that you go to, the office complex that you work, the solution to getting the gospel to them, are you ready for this? Is you. It's me. And that's what the Kingdom Project is all about. Jesus spoke more about the kingdom of God than he did any other topic or subject in scripture. And so we're going to define what the kingdom of God is in this series. We're gonna discuss what our role as not just a church, but as individuals are in the kingdom of God. The kingdom project, really more than a series 
to preach is a dream. And I'm asking you today to dream with me. What would it be like if every member of Champion Forest woke up every single day and there was just this intense desire that God births in your heart to do what our focus statement suggests, and that is to advance the kingdom of God. What would it look like if every single member of Champion Force began to pray kingdom prayers? And we're going to talk about what that even is uh, during this series. What, what would it look like if you used your gifting, your passion? Your education, the skills God has entrusted to you, what would happen if you discovered your kingdom purpose and lived with this mission to advance the kingdom? I believe on a personal level, you would experience the abundant life that Jesus talked about. And I also believe that in the process, we could transform not just our lives, but communities and everywhere we go as we seek to live on this mission. And so I want us to start today by defining what the kingdom of God is. Uh, Let me give you some ideas. Graham Goldsworthy, an Anglican theologian from Austria, he summarizes the kingdom of God as this. It's God's people and God's place under God's rule. Robbie Gallaty, a pastor buddy of mine in Tennessee, He says, the kingdom of heaven, and you need to know that whenever you see in scripture the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, they're used interchangeably. We're talking about the same exact thing. The kingdom of heaven is the work of God in the world through kingdom citizens. It's not just a realm to enter, but also a ruling of God over our present life. Rene Padilla, a theologian from Ecuador. The gospel is the good news concerning the kingdom. And the kingdom is God's rule over the totality of life. I'll give you one more. Jeremy Treat, pastor out in California. God's reign through God's people over God's place. And you'll see a hint of all of these definitions as we go on today. If I had to summarize it in a working definition, say, what, what, put all of those together, here's what I would say is the kingdom is the realm of God's rule and reign through his people. Now, as mentioned, uh, Jesus speaks more about the kingdom than any other topic or subject that he addresses. In fact, most of his teachings that we have on any subject is related in the bigger context of him teaching about the kingdom of God. His ministry, earthly ministry, is bookended in this way. In Matthew chapter four, verse 17, the Bible says from that time, as Jesus began his earthly ministry, preaching and teaching and healing, looks at what the Bible says. He began to preach saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand. He concludes his earthly ministry in Acts chapter one. You, you, you read his life and you see his teachings through this lens of the kingdom. It's all that he talked about. It's what his people wanted. It's what the disciples were looking for. And so when Jesus is raised from the dead, uh, he's about to ascend back to the Father. The disciples are there and they asked Jesus a question. When they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you, you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? This had been their focus. Is, is the kingdom starting right now? And Jesus answered, And he said, it's not for you to know the times and seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In other words, you are to extend my rule and reign through the whole earth. And then he's taken up before them and ascends to the Father. Now, when we talk about the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, we need to understand that there is an already not yet element to this, what we're talking about. Theologians call it an inaugurated eschatology, meaning that the, the, the end has already began or begun, however you say that, all right? The end's already started, okay? And let me put this on the screen for you. I'll put it like this. The kingdom of God existed in eternity, okay? The kingdom of God was initiated At the first coming of Jesus, that's what he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was inaugurated at the resurrection of Jesus. Kingdom of God 
It was, it was, it, 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 it started, right? I mean, it's happening. And then it will be consummated at the return of Jesus. This is what I mean when I say there's an already not yet element to the kingdom. It existed for all of eternity. Daniel chapter four, verse three says, the kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. It was initiated at his first coming. In Luke chapter 17, Jesus is teaching the Pharisees and the Pharisees, again, in the context of the scripture, they were looking for the coming kingdom of God. And so they asked Jesus a question in Luke 17, verse 20, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus answered and said, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. It's initiated right now. Jesus is saying it's right in front of you. It was inaugurated at his resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus vindicated his teachings. He is who he says he is. He is the risen Savior, the Lord of all, sovereign over the universe. And his kingdom expands as we, his kingdom citizens, and we'll talk more about this in just a moment, go through the whole earth testifying to his kingship. Now, the kingdom will be finally and fully complete. Already, not yet. It will be consummated at a future day whenever Jesus returns. And I wanna read you this passage of scripture because this is what it's going to be like when his kingdom It's finally and fully here. Revelation chapter 21, verses one through four. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. Very important terminology we'll come back to. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be no mourning nor crying nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. It is a future reality that has not yet happened that the ultimate kingdom that we will live in will not be up in the clouds, but rather God is bringing heaven to earth and we will live and rule and reign with him forever and ever and ever. You know, I have a confession to make. As I've read the Bible all of these years, and you, you will not be able to read it if you read it through the lens of this kingdom of God being not just in the future, But here and now, because I'm guilty of reading and whenever I see the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, would always think it would be out there somewhere. But in reality, most of the teaching, and we'll see this in this series, when Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God, he's talking about here and now. And what I've learned in studying this kingdom terminology and theology is the importance of seeing that yes, we want to take as many people to heaven with us as possible. But ultimately, the way that we do that is by living as if heaven has come to earth because it has. And ultimately, it will. This is what I call kingdom-centered living. It's a kingdom perspective. It's it's like a press box perspective, okay? Our our, our Texans fell a little bit short yesterday. They still went further than the Cowboys, all right? Now, um, (laughs) in fact, I saw saw a picture. Somebody put this on uh, uh, Twitter or X. They found pictures of the Cowboys' old Super Bowl. It's a floppy disk. Some of our young people don't even know what that is. That's how long ago it was. Here's the thing, coaches will go up in the press box so that they can see a better picture of what's going on. Well, when we talk about kingdom living, we've gotta get up into the press box and see this from a 
a big picture standpoint. And that's what I wanna do as we transition into the next part of this message. I just wanna show you from Genesis, really throughout the Bible, this kingdom language. And I wanna start in Genesis chapter one. God creates man and just listen to this kingship language. Don't miss this. Genesis chapter one, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our own likeness and let them have, what? Dominion. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. And so God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created a male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Kingship language, have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on earth. And we know what happens. God puts Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and they are to advance his kingdom, his garden type living all over the world. Fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over it. But we know what happens, sin enters. And when sin enters, Adam and Eve decide, I don't wanna live for God the king and advance his kingdom, we're gonna do what we wanna do. And that's exactly what sin is. Sin is not just rebellion against God, it is replacement of God. God, you're no longer on the throne, you're no longer king of my life, I no longer do what you have to tell me to do, I'm putting myself there. And as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, they don't advance the kingdom of God via the garden, they are kicked out of the garden. And the only thing they advance is sin because we inherited, all of us, an imputed unrighteousness, a sin nature that doesn't want God on the throne of our hearts. We want to be the sinner. That is the essence of sin. And if you look at the Old Testament, God continues to be with his people. He raises up Abraham, who ultimately becomes Israel, and he gives to Israel the law and the prophets, and to Israel, he gives them the temple. So in the garden, they have the very presence of God walking with them, and they reject that, they stiff arm that. God raises up Israel, and he gives them his presence in the temple, and they stiff arm that. He sends prophets to, to tell them to, to turn from their ways and to receive God and his presence into their life. And they stiff arm that so much so that by the time of the New Testament, 400 years have passed and not a word from God. His presence is gone. So then Jesus comes on the scene. God says, I'll send my son to be physically with them. Will they embrace his kingship? No. The Bible says he came to his own and his own received him not because his kingship didn't look like what they were looking, didn't appear as what they were looking for. They wanted an earthly ruler, a military ruler, Alexander the Great kind of leader to come on and deliver them from Roman occupation and establish an earthly rule. That's what they wanted. But Jesus, he didn't, he didn't lead like that. And when he stands before Pilate in John chapter 18, verse 36, and Pilate says, are you a king? Jesus says, I've got a king, kingdom, but it's not of this world. And so the people who have rejected God from the beginning reject even his son, God in the flesh. No king of theirs is going to wear a crown. No king of theirs is gonna go to a cross and die. And yet even then, even then, the advancement of the kingdom continues. How, why? Because Jesus doesn't stay dead. He is raised to life, championing sin and death forever. And when followers begin to follow him and give their life to him, he, by the power of the Holy Spirit, comes to live in them. And look at this, don't miss this. When God comes to live in us, this is where the kingdom project takes off because man and woman created in his image, made from the dust of the ground, they're a little bit of earth, but when God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, lives in them, they are a little bit of heaven. And so heaven and earth collide 
in man and woman made in his image. And so what happens? We become kingdom citizens and it is our job to be emissaries, ambassadors of the kingdom of God. And what Adam and Eve lost in the garden, Jesus regained in the garden where he was raised to life. And that great commission, fill the earth and subdue it, Adam and Eve couldn't accomplish it, but Jesus did. And how does he accomplish it? Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Listen to the kingship language. Jesus came and said, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. He is the reigning king. And so he tells his disciples, you go into the world and you make disciples, fill the earth, subdue it. You are my witnesses to expand my rule and reign. And he says, you make disciples, baptizing them, because baptism, the reason baptism is so important is it reveals you are a kingdom citizen. When you say, I am following you, Jesus, I want to be a citizen of your kingdom, you are marked, just as they were in the Old Testament with a physical circumcision, you are marked in the waters of baptism. That's why it's so important. He says, you go into the world, and I'll be with you even to the end of the age. And so as kingdom citizens, his emissaries, his ambassadors, the kingdom project, our job is to bring heaven to earth. And in that, the way that we live, the way that we treat people, the way that our attitudes, our actions, we should be living to give people a foretaste of the kingdom. They should see our lives and say, I want to be a part of that. And we invite them in to the kingdom of of God. The question is, are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? Uh, are you a member of the kingdom? You don't get the abundant life Jesus promised, and you don't get eternal life, i.e. life in the kingdom, apart from being a citizen of the kingdom. And so, very important question to answer today, how does one become a citizen of the kingdom? Well, Jesus answers this in a conversation in John chapter three. And he answers it talking to a man named Nicodemus. Now let me set some context for you. Nicodemus is a learned man. He is a brilliant scholar from a, from a spiritual standpoint. He is a religious leader. He knows the law of God backwards and forwards. He's prominent, he's well known, and evidently he is familiar with Jesus's ministry, okay? Now, if you wanna know what the final and full, complete kingdom of God is gonna look like, uh, you, it, it's revealed in two ways. First is what I just mentioned. Uh, if we wanna know what the final and full kingdom's gonna look like, we ought to be able to look at kingdom citizens and see it, okay? Our lives. Lifestyle evangelism. People ought to see that and go, that's, that's what the future kingdom looks like. People that are doing that. People that are investing in that. People that are acting like that. But a second way to know what the final full kingdom is look like is, is to look at the life of Jesus. He was the embodiment of the kingdom of God. And what did that look like? Well, when you look at Jesus' ministry, what, what did you see? You saw oppression gone. You saw people delivered from the demonic. You saw the lame healed. You saw the dead raised. You saw joy. You saw the will of God done perfectly and completely. This is future life in the future kingdom. Well, Nicodemus had gotten a glimpse of this. He had seen signs Jesus was doing. And he knew there was something different about him. And the Bible says he comes to the Nicodemus in the night. We don't know why he did it at night. It could have been that he would have been embarrassed being a religious leader coming to you know, talk to this street preacher. So he's trying to protect his reputation. It could be that he just wanted privacy with Jesus because Jesus was busy during the day. He was, he was doing these signs and these wonders. We don't know why, but he comes to Jesus in the night. And he has a conversation with Jesus. And Jesus tells him how he can become a citizen of the kingdom of God. John chapter three, starting in verse one, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, and this man came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi, very respectful. He says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. See, you read the scriptures through the lens of the kingdom, 
They were looking for the kingdom of God. They were waiting on it. That's why they, that's why they discarded Jesus because it wasn't what they were looking for, but they wanted the kingdom. And here Jesus is healing and his earthly ministry revealing that he is otherworldly. And Nicodemus knows it. And he says, you know, what's going on here? And Jesus cuts to the chase and he answers a question that's really in Nicodemus's heart. Look at what he says in verse three. Jesus answered him and said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. In other words, Nicodemus, you're onto something. You are right to see that I am different, that I am the Messiah, the king. But listen, how do you get into the kingdom of God? It's not going to be your intellect. It's not going to be your knowledge of God. Not how good you are, how many times you come to church. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 7, some of the scariest verses in Scripture, Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. you got to do something else than just lip service. Jesus says, you must be born again. Commentator Leon Morris puts it like this, in one sentence, Jesus sweeps away all that Nicodemus stood for and demands that he be remade by the power of God. You want to be a citizen of heaven? You want to know for sure that you are a citizen of the kingdom of God? Are you born again? What does that even mean? Nicodemus wanted to know the same question. Look at verse four. Nicodemus said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel at what I said to you. You must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. If you want to be a Citizen of the kingdom of God, you must be born again, cleansed, forgiven, made new. And Jesus, what he's doing in his goodness and grace to Nicodemus is he's using language that Nicodemus as a man learned in the scriptures would have known. This language that he uses about water and renewal and spiritual cleansing is lifted straight out of the prophet Ezekiel where Ezekiel prophesies that when the Messiah shows up, when the king is on the scene, that there will be given to people a new spirit and a new heart and there would be renewal and spiritual cleansing taking place and this being born again is not so much physical as it is spiritual. What Jesus is doing here is he's saying, Nicodemus, being born again, it's not something that you can conjure up on your own. It's like the wind blows where it wishes. And it's not something that you can explain. It must be experienced. To be born again is the greatest miracle that God performs. And Jesus, he walks Nicodemus through this Old Testament story. Again, just meeting him where, where he's at. And that's what Jesus does, man. If you're here this morning and you're going, man, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around. I just want you to know God, he will take you right where you are. And he, he starts right where you are and gets you to where you need to be. You just keep coming. You just keep listening to God's word. And he'll begin to teach you these things. I promise you he will. You just open yourself up. Say, God, I want to know. Because what he does is he tells a story out of Numbers chapter 21. Again, just using a language and story that Nicodemus would have known backwards and forwards. And it culminates with Jesus telling him in John chapter 3 verse 15. Nicodemus, whoever believes in him, Jesus, will have eternal life. Will be a citizen of the kingdom. When we believe by faith, not just with our heads, with our hearts. That Jesus is the king. And that he left the throne room of heaven and he came to earth. And this king, he wore a crown, but it was a crown of thorns and he went to a cross. 
And he died on a cross for our sins and he was raised to life. When we believe this message with our heart that it's, it's that sacrificial death of Jesus that forgives us of our sins and makes us right with God. And we humbly come to him and say, Jesus, I want to be a kingdom citizen. I want you enthroned on my heart. It's at this point that you are born again and become a member of the kingdom of God. And so I ask you, are you a citizen of the kingdom? Last week I was in California. I was speaking at an event, and it just so happened to be three of my four girls' birthdays, okay? The twins had a birthday. My middle had a birthday. And so being out in California where I was speaking, the event was at Disneyland, I thought to be a good dad, I'm bringing the family out here on their birthdays, okay? And so I would speak in the morning and then meet up with them uh, after, and I had the time of my life. Usually I'm in a really bad mood at Disney, all right? Too many people, it's hot. Uh, matter of fact, Debbie has a nickname for me around the house when I'm in a bad mood. She's like, oh, it's Disney Jarrett, he's here, okay? I mean, that's her nickname for me when I'm in a bad mood. But it was out in California, the weather was great hooded sweatshirt, and I, man, I'm reading on this kingdom stuff and getting ready for this series, and as we're walking into Disneyland, if you've ever been there, uh, here's a picture of uh, Disneyland, and you walk under this tunnel right here, and you see that sign right above the tunnel? Uh, as you're walking in, here's the sign. Here you leave today and enter the world of yesterday, tomorrow, and of fantasy. Just keep that sign up because when I walk through there, you walk through there and, and you really are transported into a different place. You get through that sign right there and it opens up and there's old school Main Street. And you keep walking and down to the right is Tomorrowland and there's this big castle there in the middle. I mean, it is a kingdom. It is a different kingdom. And I'm, I'm studying all this about the kingdom of God and I look at that sign, I'm thinking, you know what? That, that's, that's our life. You know, when, we, when you're born again, when you enter into the kingdom of God, you leave today and you enter the world of yesterday. You're a part of what God originally established in the Garden of Eden. And you're a part of the world tomorrow because there is a final kingdom coming where we will live and rule and reign with Jesus forever and ever and ever on a new earth. And it would be a world of fantasy because Paul said when we are with Jesus forever, heaven on earth is what we're waiting on. He says, no eye can see, nor mind can imagine, nor heart has conceived what God has planned for those who love him. And so here's the question, champion, for us. Are you a citizen of the kingdom of God? You must be born again. Would you pray with me? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And if you've never trusted in Jesus, now is the time. You're just a simple prayer of faith. Jesus, I'm following you. You're the king of my life now. I want you enthroned on my heart. I'm taking self off. I'm turning from sin. And I want you ruling and reigning in the throne of my life. A simple prayer of faith. You just, Jesus, make me a kingdom citizen. And Jesus will hear your prayer. And the Bible teaches if you're praying that prayer and you mean it from your heart, he will come to live inside of you through the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and instantaneously, automatically, you are made a citizen of the kingdom. You say, what's the next step? You're to get baptized because baptism marks you as a citizen kingdom. It shows the world that you're living for a new kingdom. If you're trusting in Christ, I wanna encourage you, take that important step of baptism. Join a church. The church and the kingdom are not the same thing. The church is an outpost of the kingdom. And so we come here every week and we learn together and we pray together and we worship together and we get strengthened together to go out into the world to advance his kingdom cause and we get tired and we get broken down and we get hurt and you know what we do we come back to the outpost where we can get a little bit of a reprieve and we can hear from God once again in his word and then we go back out and we continue to advance the kingdom that's why you need to be a part of a church as an outpost of the kingdom in just a moment I'm gonna pray and we're gonna receive the Lord's Supper the Lord's Supper is open to anyone who is a kingdom citizen. If you trusted in Jesus, you can take the Lord's Supper. And that supper 
talk about a kingdom being of yesterday, tomorrow. The supper is simply a time for us as a faith family under the kingship of Jesus to take of the elements. The bread represents Jesus' body broken. The fruit of the vine represents his blood poured out. We take of these elements and we look back at the sacrifice of Jesus. But we don't just look back, we look ahead. Because Jesus said, as I'll show you here in just a minute, that I will not take of this supper again when he initiated it with his disciples. He said, I won't take it again until I take it with you in the kingdom. And so it's a foretaste. When we experience the Lord's Supper, it's a foretaste of the kingdom to come. And so what I want you to do is our deacons serve us. I want you to serve your neighbor. Uh, the praise team's gonna sing over us, and as they sing, I want you to examine yourself. That's what the scripture says. When we come to take the Lord's Supper, we are to examine ourselves. Are we living as kingdom citizens? And where our lives and our attitudes and our language and our behavior doesn't line up, we, we don't just take the Lord's Supper on a whim. We repent, and we say, okay, I'm a kingdom citizen. Lord, by your grace, I'm gonna live like it. And so as they sing over us, I want you to hold those elements in your hand and you pray and you reflect, you're serving your neighbor and then we'll come back after a time of worship and we'll receive these elements together. Lord, thank you so much for today. Thank you, Lord, for our wonderful deacons who are serving us. And as we receive this supper, Lord, we receive it as citizens of the kingdom, looking forward to one day taking it with you again in the future looking backward, thanking you for your sacrifice. Lord, we're a grateful people. We worship you. Everything changed. It's getting harder to recognize. The person I was Before I encountered Christ I don't walk like I used to I don't talk like I used to I was washed from the inside I was washed from the inside out Hallelujah Hallelujah I know it was the blood could have only been the blood Hallelujah, hallelujah I know it was the blood Could have only been the blood For it's only by your blood And I cannot explain but nothing's more real than this in the presence of God oh what my heart experienced when my shame hit the wayside and my sin met the most high I was washed from the inside I was washed from the inside out been the blood hallelujah hallelujah i know it was the blood could have only been the
so what can I say? Cause thank you is not enough. But Jesus, your grace, it's your mercy poured out for us. I will love you forever, here on earth into heaven. I was washed from the inside. I was washed from the inside out. We've been washed from the inside. We've been washed from the inside out. On that night that Jesus shared a meal with the disciples, the Bible says he took them into an upper room. And Matthew chapter 26 shares exactly what Jesus did there. I want to show you this passage on the screen. It says he broke the bread as they were eating. Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And then Jesus continued. The Bible says he took a cup when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying, drink of it, all of you. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. He concludes by saying this. It's exactly what we talked about today. Jesus said, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What a beautiful picture. One day, we're gonna have dinner with the King. And so we say, to him be the glory, the honor, forever and ever, amen. Amen. I want you to stand across the room. Uh, we've given an invitation, if you've never trusted in Christ, and you prayed with me earlier to receive Christ, we're gonna sing just a couple of verses of a song and we want you to come if you came with someone they'll come with you maybe you need to join the church you want to join this outpost called champion for us why don't you come forward we have a membership class next week we'll get you signed up for and uh, you can learn how to be a member here at champion for us or maybe you just need prayer i have no idea what god's doing in your heart and life but our pastors are going to be here and here and here and here in the balcony area you don't have to come all the way down they're going to be at the exit signs but we're going to sing and if you need to make your decision public long to make your decision public we rejoice in it why don't you come forward right now as we sing come on right now which means praise the Lord. And don't you want to praise the Lord right now for those that came forward that are being prayed over, making decisions. Never want you to leave without your questions answered. Uh, we have a connection room right here in the back. My right, your left, you see the door open there. If you ever have any questions about what it means to be a Christian, growing in your walk with the Lord, what it means to be a member of our church, just need prayer, we have great members of our church back there, staff back there eager and ready uh, to greet you. And if you are making a decision to put resources in your hand to help you grow in your faith, uh, we rejoice in that. You know, we say one of our focus priorities is making disciples. And we do that uh, in our student ministry. One of the biggest ways is through our Freedom Weekend coming up okay and so I want to encourage you if you're in sixth grade through 12th grade uh, here in two weeks you want to be a part of freedom just a weekend to get out of the normal routine be here with your friends centered on worship and and hearing from the Word of God uh, if you want any information just text freedom to 77069 uh, but students don't you agree that freedom weekend is just the best ever or do we have any students in the house all right son it's the best ever you want to be here and uh, life-changing weekend there also want you to be aware that our merge and re-engage ministries start up 
this next week. And so if you're interested in that, just text EVENTS uh, to 77069. Again, thank you for being here. Go by uh, the Great Hall and see CareNet, H3 Helpline, Life 624. Learn about those ministries. Go out to the lawn. It's cold, but you can get something. Come on in and eat, all right? Or go take it home. Uh, But have a great day. God bless you. Uh, We'll see you next week.